we're using an acronym that we call TELL. Everybody say TELL. And this acronym is explaining how we can share the good news. John taught us about truth. Everybody say truth. That's the T in TELL. The second week, he spoke to us about evangelism must matter. Everybody say evangelism. And this morning, I have the privilege of talking to you about the first L, which is live it out. Everybody say live it out. There's a frequently attributed quote to Mahatma Gandhi that says, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. That is convicting because what it does is it amplifies the importance of us as believers in Christ. Those of us who have made the decision to place our faith in Christ to actually behave based on what we believe. There's another quote I like a little better from John Wesley. He says, get on fire for God and men will come and see you burn. That's so good because conversely, John Wesley says, if we actually behave based on what we believe, if we actually are able to live out our faith, if we can be so on fire as followers of Jesus Christ, people who do not believe will just come to see what you're burning about. What are you so excited about? What has inspired you to transform your life? So how we live dictates and determines what others actually believe about the God we say we trust. Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum, several days later the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. It's amazing what happens when Jesus actually shows up in a place. I think we're experiencing some of that here at Quest Family. That, that, that's the reason y'all are having to park on the sidewalks. That's the reason we have ushers helping you find seats. I'm so excited to see that Jesus is here. When Jesus is here, you run out of room. Yeah, that's good. It's while he was preaching God's word to them four men arrived carrying carrying a paralyzed man on a mat they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd so they dug a hole through the roof above his head <laughs> Some of this is for education, not application. If you do that, you're going to jail, but we'll talk about that then. <laughs> We're talking about how to get people to Jesus. This, all of this isn't applicable. Don't, you'll be arrested. Yeah. <laughs> and they lowered the man on his mat. Can you imagine seeing this on the ring? Uh, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm losing focus. <laughs> right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, oh, this is the great part, my child, your sins. Everybody say, my sins are forgiven. Woo! Often in scripture, physical disease is used as a metaphor for spiritual disease. Isaiah says in the first chapter of Isaiah, 
verse 5, I believe it is, why do you continue to invite punishment? Must you rebel forever? Your head is injured and your heart is sick. The prophet Isaiah is not speaking about physical injury to head or physical sickness of the heart. He is actually speaking to Israel about their inability to follow God because of the way that they're thinking and because of the desires of their heart. The reason I love Quest, or one of the reasons I love Quest, is that we're able to reach people on all levels of faith, whether they're new believers, whether they're deciding if they want to place their faith in Christ, or whether they're mature believers. We're glad that all of you all are here. But this text is telling us that if we are able to live out our faith, if we're actually able to show others why we believe in Jesus, that lives will be transformed. Israel was not able to actually place their faith in God, so the world would look at them as if they were sick. That, that when people saw Israel, those who actually believed in God, those who wanted to follow God, when they would see Israel, they would scratch their heads and say, what are you doing? Your, your, your actions are not emblematic of your faith. And this morning, we want to talk about what it is actually like to live out our faith. Can our friends see our faith? Can our families see our faith? In, in our story this morning, we see a man that's physically disabled, but the brokenness in his body is actually pointing to a bigger problem, and that is the brokenness in his spirit. John reminded us that the truth about the good news actually comes from the bad news and the bad news is that we are all sinners and we have all fallen short of God's glory I know I wouldn't get a lot of uh, hand claps on on that one we, we we all have sinned we all have fallen short of God's glory it's hard to to be excited about the good news until we're able to embrace the bad news the bad news is that we have all sinned if you're not sure you're a sinner ask your spouse <laughs> if you're not sure you're a sinner ask your kids we have all made mistakes but the reason we are excited about what Jesus has done in our life. And the reason we should be motivated to live out our faith is because Jesus died on a cross to take the punishment for the sins that we committed. Jesus gave his life so that we could have life more abundantly. Is there anybody that can get a little excited this morning that we don't have to be punished for our sins because Jesus was punished for our sins. That is why we should live out our faith. Jesus, born of a virgin, lived a virtuous life, died a vicarious death. We were the ones that were supposed to be punished for our sins. We were the ones that were supposed to be punished for our selfishness. We were the ones that were supposed to be punished for our unfaithfulness. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have ever lasting life. David reminds us, for I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. In other words, we should see ourselves in the text this morning because we were all born with a disability called sin. We were all born broken in our spirit with the inability to follow God. 
righteously. But because of our faith, we can shine the light about Jesus so that others can follow. That's what we see in Mark chapter 2. It says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum, several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. Everybody say compassion. When we see people who need to know Christ, the question is, are you moved with compassion? I've got to be honest that to a certain degree, my eyes have adjusted to the dark. When you go in a dark room, I don't know if you knew this or not, your pupils begin to enlarge and extract light from the dark, from the light that is in the room that you couldn't see initially. So the room that was pitch black, you can now begin to see a little because your eyes have what? Adjusted to the dark. And I believe that in a real sense, our eyes as, as Christians, those of us who've placed our faith in Jesus, our eyes have begun to adjust to the dark. The sensitivity that we should have to sin, the sensitivity that we should have to those who are struggling with life, the sensitivity that we should have, the compassion that Jesus has, if we're honest, we have struggled with. And when we see those who don't know the Jesus that we know, our eyes have adjusted to the dark. I was on 520 leaving the mall unashamedly. You know, I believe that being fresh is the way that I share my faith. Amen. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that if I don't feel clean, how can I share Christ? And so I'm leaving the mall and I see something interesting. I see an accident on the side of the road. And I see a police officer on the side of the road. I also see a reporter from what I believe may have been Channel 12 News on the side of the road. And I also see the ambulance on the side of the road. And I'm seeing this, and I, f I feel that the Holy Spirit began to speak to my spirit with this scene. And I began to ask myself, what's going on? And I began to think that the police officer is there to figure out who broke the law. And then the reporter is there to share the news about what had happened. And then the ambulance is there to take whoever was hurting to a place where they could receive healing. Now, obviously, we know we need police officers to keep us in line. And we need reporters to share what's going on in our community so we can make better decisions in our daily lives. But when I asked myself who I would want to be on that scene, it wasn't the police officer who was there to determine the law. And it wasn't the reporter who was there to share the news, good or bad, about whatever happened. I want us to be the ambulance on the scene 
of people's lives. I don't want us when we see somebody broken, when we see somebody hurting, when we see somebody who needs healing just to be the reporter. We have enough people gossiping and telling news about stuff that we don't need to hear. We have enough people running up in people's lives telling them all about what they're doing wrong and what they should be doing right and how they're breaking God's law. What I would love for us to be is the ambulance in people's lives. People who come onto the scene when people are broken, when people are hurting, when people need healing. And our goal is to get them from hurting to get them to healing. Our goal is to get them from suffering to get them to our Savior. Our goal is to take a person that needs healing and take them to the healer. That's what we see here in Mark we see four men who see somebody else that is broken, that is struggling with life. And they don't just look and turn their heads. They are moved with compassion. And they pick this man up on a mat. Oh, man, that's so good. What are we willing to do to reach the loss? I told the nine o'clock, I don't want to hear you complaining about parking. <laughs> I don't want you, I, I want you all when we ask you to move from nine to 12 p.m. to do it with joy. You want to know why? Because there's somebody at the 1030 who can't get in and, and maybe us being inconvenienced is showing a little compassion for that person who needs to hear the message. Because when you're compassionate about the loss, you embrace inconvenience for the loss. When you see a person suffering that has not met your Savior, you begin to ask yourself, how can I suffer? How can I be inconvenienced? How can I take the blessings that I have and make somebody else's life better? A Christian's job is to live out their faith in a way to where we take the blessings of God and we don't hoard them. We do not take hold of these blessings self selfishly and self-centered we take the blessings of God and we ask ourselves how can I use what I have to make somebody else's life better that's what it means to let your light shine oh it's interesting that Jesus told his disciples that the world would know you not by your education not by your title not by your career path, not by how many dollars you have in your bank account. He said they will know you by your love. My goal is to help this city no quest by our love. That's why we should be in our communities. That's why you should be sharing your faith on your jobs. That's why we should be in our schools. That's why we should be serving in the hospitals. That's why we should be praying for our schools when we hear about these fights and we hear about these shootings. We are here to show love. Here it is. When you truly have received grace, you understand that the grace you have received has to be reciprocated. God demonstrated his love in this when we were yet sinners. Christ died. Oh, you, you ought to get excited about that. When you were still at the club, when you were still at the bar, when you could barely make it home. I know I wasn't the only one yet. Yeah. God didn't wait for you to get it together. God said, I am going to show up in this person's life. I am going to show my grace. I hope you know that the Holy Spirit was in your life before you even knew that the Holy Spirit was in your life. I don't like it when people say, I found Jesus. Let me help you with your verbiage. Jesus found you. Oh, Jesus gave you grace. 
He said, I loved you when you were hating me. I was covering you when you were persecuting me. And so guess what? You need to keep the same energy. Not only do we see compassion, we see the crowd. It says that they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. Don't miss it. If you read it too fast, you won't get it. They were trying to get their friend to Jesus, but they couldn't get their friend to Christ. Why? Because of the crowd. They, in effect, were trying to evangelize the loss but their evangelism tactics were impacted and impeded by the crowd. If we're not careful, we will struggle living out our faith because of the crowd. Oh yeah, if we're honest, some of us are afraid even to mention the name of Jesus because of the culture we live in. Oh, let's just be honest. Some of us don't even want to, anyone to know we know Jesus because we're too concerned about the crowd. Oh yeah, we should be sensitive to the crowd. We should be loving towards the crowd. We, we need to build social equity and earn the right to speak into people's lives. Please don't show up just telling a person what they did wrong and what they're not doing right and how you live so much better than they do. That's not what I'm talking about. What, what I am talking about, though, is actually being brave and confident about the Christ that is in you and being confident enough to share about what Jesus has done for you. Not pointing out what they've done wrong, but maybe shining a light on what you're able to do right because of what Jesus has done right. Maybe how you're able to show love because of the love that Jesus has shown you. We don't want to be chameleon Christians. A chameleon has a unique gift. A chameleon actually has the ability to change colors and blend in to any surrounding. But do you want to know what triggers the chameleon and that gift? Fear. When the chameleon feels under attack by the crowd, when the chameleon fears under, feels under attack by the culture, what the chameleon begins to do to protect itself is it changes its beautiful colors, that which God gave it so that it stands out, the thing that God gave it so that others in its community can see that it's a little different when it feels under attack it actually begins to blend in so that there's no difference between the chameleon and the environment let me help us this morning that is not what God has called us to do he said you ought to be a light that shines and nobody would take a light and put it under a bowl as a matter of fact they put a light on a stand and it gives light to everybody in the house don't be afraid to share what God has done in your life for God has not given you a spirit of fear but a spirit of love power and a sound mind don't be afraid to share your testimony <laughs> don't let the crowd cause you to become a chameleon you the influence not the influenced don't feel like you have to laugh about things that aren't funny when you're in the office. 
Don't feel as if when you're in the locker room, you have to speak how all the other athletes speak and talk how all the other athletes talk and do all the things that the other athletes do. Don't be afraid, so afraid of the crowd that you become a chameleon. Because when you show your colors, guess what happens? God moves and the crowd begins to change. Not only do we see compassion, not only do we see the crowd, but we also see the cleansing. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head and they lowered the man on this mat, Ryan down in front of Jesus. I forgot to tell the nine. That's why I, I, I love the 1030 because I got my practice out the way. Um, sometimes with evangelism, John, don't we have to be patient as pastors? This did not happen overnight. It, it seems as if they built some sort of contraption to bring their friend into his faith. Sometimes as the church, I'm guilty. I'm still praying about my patience. <laughs> we believe that people's beginning ought to be our end. Again, another reason why I love our church. We love seeing people grow and we understand that it takes time we've got to work with people what they've been dealing with for a decade is not going to change in one day we can't ever forget though we may feel as if we're mature in our faith and we understand where we are now that it took us years to get to where we are and and the people that we're trying to reach are not going to change overnight so what type of work are we willing to do to reach them how much time are we willing to spend to reach them what type of resources are we willing to invest in the loss to reach them these men did not just show up with this man on a mat they also built some sort of contraption to get the man in a position to where he he could be ministered to. Ooh. Seeing their faith, <laughs> Jesus is looking at, I, I believe dirt is dropping on Jesus' head. And he's looking up. And he sees five men who believed in his power enough to spend their day trying to deliver somebody who was spiritually disabled. And he's looking as this dirt is dropping on his head and saying to himself, wow, what type of faith spends their time being compassionate? What type of faith spends their day trying to deliver somebody that's disabled? What type of faith takes the time and the resources to build a contraption that could properly place this disabled person in a position to where he could be touched by Christ in the midst of the crowd? And he looks and says, my child, your sins have been forgiven. He looks at their faith family, the faith of these men, and he says, your sins have been forgiven. The 
faith of these four men was so strong that it delivered their friend from his sin. I know we want to reach the world with our faith. But let's start with our friends. Let's start with our family. I know you want to reach the world, but the Bible says, he who's faithful over little, she who's faithful over little will be made ruler over much. Let's not skip Augusta trying to reach Africa. Let's not skip the CSRA or, or, and, 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 and let, let, let's make sure that we are ministering to our friends. Let's make sure we are ministering to our families. Let's make sure that our faith is so strong that when God sees our faith, he begins to move in our friends. I love what Paul shares about his testimony when he wrote in his book, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. I want us to be just as confident as Paul was that if you don't know Jesus, you could get to know Jesus by knowing me. Dear Heavenly Father, will you use our faith to reach others? Will you help us to live out what we believe in a way that's so dynamic that it will deliver those who are lost? Strengthen us, remove fear, remove doubt that our light may shine so brightly even in the midst of the crowd. Amen.